Okay, here's a, a quote from a 1975 article. For the Trotskyists, therefore, capitalism on its death agony, and the only question remained how it would end. They presented only two alternatives, socialism or a catastrophe that would threaten the whole culture of mankind. This is a, a version which verges on the idiotic alternative of socialism or barbarism that you get the left communists proposing. The foolishness of this becomes evident as soon as we look behind the phrases to see just what it implies. For Marxism, barbarism isn't just a slogan or catchword, but as used by Engels and Morgan, it's a scientific concept. It marks a stage of society in which horticulture but not field agriculture was developed. Under barbarism, there's no division of society into classes or territorial states. Barbarism would only be possible now if all the developments of technology over the last two or three millennia were wiped out, something which should scarcely even happen in an atomic war. Now, if there's a crisis, there are two possible exits from the crisis. They weren't socialism or barbarism, but socialism or reorganised capitalism. Either the working class was sufficiently organised, politically, military, ideologically, to take power and abolish capitalism. On the absence of that initiative, history didn't stand still. Capitalism reorganised itself. And when you look at the economic pulses, you see that the leadership of the Fourth International had little more understanding of the economic crisis than most capitalist statesmen had. But by that point, the Polish Luxembourgist economist Kalecki had shown that it was in fact possible for capitalism to escape from the slump. If they'd used Marxist theory to examine the situation, that's to say the theory in Volume 3 of Capital, they would have seen that the, the crisis was a crisis of the ideological fiscal monetary superstructure, but not of the base. The ad adoption of an appropriate fiscal monetary policies would regenerate economic growth. But before this had to occur, there had to be an ideological struggle, there had the political resistance of some sections of the bourgeoisie, especially bank capital, had to be overcome. But Marx provided the theoretical basis for this in his... Um, writings on the British banking legislation. Now, according to Trotsky, a minimum programme of reforms within bourgeois society was now impossible, let's say in the late 30s. The demands put forward in his programme were ones that he believed capitalism would be unable to meet. Demands stemming from today's conditions and today's consciousness of wide layers of the working class will inevitably lead to one final conclusion, the conquest of power by the working class. But the problem with this is it's Lafargus, not Marxist. And the second problem is that if you advance impossible demands, your credibility goes down. The third problem is that it's, it's mired in economism. Why do I say Lafargus? Well, Guy and Lafargue were leaders of the French Socialist Party, and Marx helped draft the programme for that party. I've, I've got other videos on this programme. Marx thought it contained practical objectives that were worth struggling for. Gide, on the other hand, was an impossibilist, and he thought these things would free the proletariat of its last reformist illusions and convince it of the impossibility of avoiding a workers' 89, by which he means 1789 French Revolution. This prompted Marx to say, if Gide and Lafargue represented Marxism in France, then ce qu'il y a de certain, c'est que moi, je ne suis pas Marxiste. Meaning, in that case, I'm certainly no Marxist. So Trotsky is repeating the old Lafargue's notion that reforms were impossible under capitalism. His one modification was to concede that they may have been possible in the 19th century, but not now, when he was writing in the 1930s. But, of course, you're saying this on the eve of a long period of sustained reforms. Um, modern Trotskyists know that some reforms are possible, so they have a more nuanced view of things. But you'll still find, in some of the smaller sects, Trotskyist sects, people saying capitalism can no longer afford reforms. But as then there's the issue of credibility. Suppose you could get support for demands you knew were impossible. What would that do for left credibility? It doesn't help to lead people into something you know will fail. 
it'll just discredit you politically when it does fail. Instead, a party must promise that when in power, it'll take measures which actually would resolve an economic crisis. Let's look at what the key demands were. Number one, sliding scale of wages. That's just a trade union demand. Something trade unions historically have achieved. Nothing wrong with that. But there's nothing specifically involving a transition to socialism about that. A factory militia. Well, again, these were things that the US trade unions actually did organise, not only in the 1930s, but in earlier strikes. But it's highly unlikely that these would ever be sufficient to allow an overthrow of the state. Whenever they became dangerous, the US governors would call out the National Guard and these militias were suppressed. Uh, an armed overthrow of national power is only basically possible if a crisis leads to a mutiny in the army or if you're in a place where prolonged guerrilla warfare is possible like Cuba or China. His next demand was to open the books and ab abolish commercial secrecy. Well, that's of relatively limited use. The final two demands, as he put them, were to expropriate separate groups of capitalists and nationalise the banks. But these are just classic minimum programme demands taken from the Communist Manifesto. Nothing new about this. And Marx and Engels called these measures. They didn't call them demands. They assumed that the Communist Party had formed the government. They're a government programme. And in fact, when the Communist Party took power in Berlin in 1945, it carried these measures out. But they're not demands that you make of an existing government. You don't demand that the um, Tory government in Westminster expropriate groups of capitalists and nationalise the banks. The problem is that this use of demands is either an empty phrase because nobody pays any attention to what small groups of Trotskyists are demanding or it's best a trade union tactic. Trade union can say we demand cost of living increases or we go on strike. But such individual trade union struggles don't translate into a program to resolve a national economic crisis. They could only become political if the trade unions were strong enough to demand specific state reforms. Lenin, in what is to be done, argued against the idea that economic struggle would lead to socialist politics. He said, instead, you need a social democratic party that openly advance a program of democratic revolution and socialist economic transformation. And this would stand on its own platform in elections, something that the Trotskyists generally don't do. The experience of the 1970s in Britain was that the Trotskyists argued for more militant strike action and higher wages, sticking to the transitional program demands. They didn't campaign for the TUC to support workers' control legislation, didn't advance an alternative economic strategy for the national economy. Result was prolonged inflation, a perceived failure of social democracy, and the result, a Tory victory, not a revolution. Policies that fail just...